Um, good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, thank you for coming along. Um, we have what um, looks to be a fantastic um, talk from Martin this afternoon. Those of you that have seen the, the latest Brooklyn's Bulletin will have a kind of sneak preview of, of what Martin's going to talk about this afternoon. Um, but yeah, I, I'll just hand straight over and, and let Martin crack on. Hi, well, uh, good afternoon everybody. Thanks for coming along. Um, Martin shows my name and the title of this talk is Frank Alfred Learns to Fly uh, at Brooklands in 1913. And uh, there's a bit of background to all of this which I think we need to uh, give you. Um, people may or may not have heard of me before. If you're a member of the Vintage Motorcycle Club, for the last year or so I've been writing a column in the Vintage Club magazine called Mo Motorcycling Milestones, which is my attempt as a, an amateur historian to fill in the gaps left in the magazine by people like Titch Allen and Phil Heath and many others who wrote about the history of motorcycling because they were kind of very involved in the early days of the club. And as these people got older and died, they weren't there to produce that kind of information. And the membership of the club is very much now skewed towards later period machines, the sort of machines I rode as a kid, which, needless to say, interest me in one way, but they don't interest me in the context of vintage anything, because they're not vintage anything. They're all post-war. So basically, I um, have been retired. I used to work in the space industry. I was one of the directors of the British National Space Centre at the time that we did that wonderful epic uh, experiment, the Beagle 2 voyage to Mars, which was a wonderful, albeit typically failed, British attempt to land on Mars and discover whether, whether there was life there. Uh, some people cynically might say you don't need to go to Mars to work out whether there was life there, but that's another, that's another for another occasion. Um, but basically, when the um, Mark Beagle 2 lander failed, I had a very unsurprising offer of early retirement, perhaps, because I'd been so vocal in support of the Beagle 2 mission. When it failed, they wanted to expunge all the people involved who... Were, had any connections with Beagle 2, so I got given an offer of early retirement, which, because I was also very interested in old vehicles, I thought this would be a great chance to abandon working for space industry and start being more professional about what I did with motorcycle history and restoring old vehicles and public speaking, because I did a lot of public speaking about Beagle 2 all around the world. I went to Russia twice uh, to talk about European achievements in space, which you might think was rather bold, but there we go. But basically, I went and gave talks to the Rolls-Royce Heritage Trust at the Rolls-Royce Engine Factory at Inchinnan in Scotland, which is where I encountered the Rolls-Royce Heritage Trust series of historical books, which of, this, of which this is one. Uh, this is Frank Halford's biography, written in not in the early 1990s and published in 1998, I think. And it's called From Box Kite to Jet. So it's the story of Frank Halford, who you'll hear a bit more about today. But the book was written by a man who sadly died shortly afterwards. So when I found in the book a picture, you'll see the picture I'm about to, I'm about to show you here. Um, basically, in that um, book was a picture. And the picture is that, which shows three motorcycles in front of the house in Nottingham, Ed Walton, which is a suburb of Nottingham, where Frank Halford's father was the, the um, he was a sheriff of Nottingham, ironically, uh, and he, he, in 1913, he was very keen, a very keen racing motorcyclist, and these were the three motorcycles that he ran. And what struck me immediately when I saw this picture in the book was, first of all, I actually restored a 1909 Triumph, which is virtually identical to the Triumph that's in this uh, picture. And then I restored a 1911 Rudge, which again, you can see, is virtually identical to the Rudge in the picture. My Rudge actually, when it was 100 years old in 2011, it was featured in the centre spread of the classic motorcycle as the featured bike that, that, that month. And uh, I was quite pleased to see it repeated, uh, you know, in, in a public place because I sold it in 1986 when I moved from Scotland down to London. 
and my bank manager thought I ought to sell off all these old bikes and put some money into the deal to buy a house in London, which I regret to this day. But the fact that the chap I sold it to still has it and mentioned it when it was featured in the magazine, that was pleasing. But the middle bike was actually an interesting thing called a Martin Jap. And people may have heard of Harry Martin, who's the maker and builder and racer of the Martin Jap. But Martin was um, a former Edwardian cyclist and motorcyclist at Canning Town, the London banked track, which I suppose predated um, Brooklyn's by many years. And there he raced bicycles and then he raced motor bicycles, mostly Excelsiors, which was a large engine clipped to the frame of what was virtually a bicycle. Um, then he went on to manufacture motorcycles and in fact he had a works in Cherry Orchard Road, Croydon, where he built bikes. And bikes like that he brought to Brooklands. And uh, there is a picture of him at Brooklands with his Martin Jap. But I wanted to know more about this Martin Jap because I was in the process of restoring it. And when I saw this picture, which was credited to a lady called Anne Spring, I then discovered that Anne Spring was Frank Halford's stepdaughter. And her, uh, she had actually passed away by the time I was making these investigations. And through connections I can't even now exactly remember, but I managed to locate Jeremy Spring, who's actually in the audience today, who's Anne's son. And after a bit of negotiation, uh, I was delighted that uh, Jeremy agreed to lend me the albums. And when the albums were sent, I had no real idea what they contained, because obviously I'd only seen a few pictures of motorcycles credited to Anne Spring, which was where these pictures came from. So uh, when the actual albums arrived, they're actually on the table here. These two little volumes, fairly typical standard albums, which have got brown mounts with pictures in cardboard mounts. And unusually for albums of this period, every single picture in the album virtually had a caption and the captions were quite explanatory, which was very helpful. But before I get into describing the contents of that, I'd like to give you a bit more background about Frank Halford, because he was born in the 1890s, and uh, 1894, and he, like many kids of the age, was fascinated by technology. There was a pioneering magazine that you may have heard of, which was called The English Mechanic and World of Science, and it was published in Britain, and it was a bit like Popular Mechanics in America. It was a very well-read, widely distributed magazine, which talk, not only talked about technology of all branches, it wasn't just about one particular type of thing, it was very broad-based. And the English Mechanic and World of Science published a whole series of articles about aviation, about motoring, about motorcycling, about bicycles, about any kind of engineering, railway engineering, marine engineering, and so on. And as an example, in the 1890s, they published a series of articles about how to build your own motorcycle. And they started off publishing drawings and information about how to take a bunch of castings and raw materials and to build the patterns to have a crankcase cast and then patterns to make a cylinder barrel and have a cylinder barrel cast. And then as time went on, the further parts described all that was involved in building your own engine and then building a frame to put the engine in to have a motorcycle. And they did the same again with cars. And famously, there is a, a, one example of a car that was built by somebody to the drawings. And it's called in the Veteran Car Club surviving list of cars, the English Mechanic. So it was given the name the English Mechanic, even though it was actually built by an individual in his own workshop, using the instructions that were published in the English Mechanic. Now, when the kids of that period were looking at these magazines and having their imagination fueled by the articles they were reading, and if they were wealthy, they might have their parents buy them a lathe and buy them bits and pieces of metal and maybe even buy castings or patterns or things that were available to turn their reading into reality. But in the case of Frank, he was, he was not even really he was going to school at this point. And the choice of school that his father uh, agreed to go through with was a school in Essex called Felstead. Now, Felstead is a boarding school. And Felstead particularly had a big engineering faculty. 
they, they prided themselves on the fact that they wanted to, shall we say, develop fertile minds who were interested in this new scientific age. And it's very interesting that at that period, you know, mostly professional people, you know, vicars or, or lawyers or doctors or teachers even, were very much interested in arts type education. So for somebody to be supporting a child who was interested in engineering and technology was very, very forward thinking. And Felstead had this engineering faculty, and when the young Halford went there with his brother, he was basically absolutely captivated by the engineering school at Felstead. And when he came out of the other end of the school, he basically um, went, he decided he would try and get a place at Nottingham University College. And because he'd been at Felstead School, where in effect he'd done a lot of the coursework, for the first year, the first part of the engineering tripos, the, music, the university authorities granted him admission to the second year of the engineering tripos, which was quite unusual that somebody should, as it were, be given a buy into the second round, as it were. So he started in 1912 with the second year of the engineering tripos. And as he was working, I've actually spoken to the museum authorities, and clearly his work was well regarded. He was, you know, what, what, what records exist of his progress at the University College studying engineering. He was a model pupil. He was a very able chap. But all the while, he was absolutely riveted by machinery in the practical sense. So one of the things he got into at a very early age was actually motorcycle competition. So... He, started, he bought these motorcycles that you see there. He bought them one at a time, obviously. But when you look at the motorcycle magazine of 1912 and 1913, you find evidence of his successes in local competition. And he joined the Nottingham and District Motorcycle Club. And there are quite a number of reports where his name appears. And this is one. And um, again, it re references to Frank Halford. And in, he, he took part in various events. This is the Chesterfield and District motorcycle club and you know he is riding in this event he, he's actually described as riding a bruff now he didn't actually own the bruff the bruff was lent to him and the bruff was not what is now called the bruff superior you'll be aware i'm sure that bruff superiors were built in nottingham so i suppose you could say the bruff was his local manufacturer but the bruff here was actually built by the father w.e bruff and bruff's father was rather unpleased when his son launched the thing called the Bruff Superior because he rather cynically said to his son I suppose that's that makes mine the Bruff Inferior <laughs> well people have views on that subject but Bruff Superior were, were launched after the First World War but in the early part of the of, of the pre-First World War period the flat twin W.E. Bruff was quite a, a potent thing and quite a successful machine and I suspect we don't know for sure but the Halford Bruff was probably loaned to him by the factory. And it was partly because they saw him as a very competent rider. Still a young man. And when he was at, uh, obviously, at the university, he was reading widely on the subject, and he obviously thought that the, the, the true destination for his talents would be in the aviation world. And in how do you step from the world of engineering, and indeed the world of motorcycles, into aviation? And he more or less concluded that the best entry ticket he could get to a career in aviation was learning to fly. Now, when you were at that period of your life, he was a teenager still, and learning to fly in 1912 or 1913 basically involved finding a flying school, which had aircraft and that would teach him to fly, and then providing a large sum of money, which was the, the, the price of participating in this rather... Um, shall we say, uncertain career path. But in order to do so, he had to persuade his mother to lend him £75. Now, in 1913, £75 was an awful lot of money. So he had to demonstrate his seriousness. And he found the Br Bristol School of Flying, which at that point, there were in 19, by the end of 1913, there were something like 660 flying certificates issued by the Royal Flying Club which was the authority that, uh, that managed that kind of side of things. And of the 660 flying certificates that they issued up to the end of 1913, roughly half of them were actually issued by the Bristol School of Flying, this 
advertised here. And the Bristol School of Flying had two uh, locations. One was at Lark Hill on Salisbury Plain, and one was at Brooklyn's Track. And at Brooklyn's Track in 1913, there were many flying schools. In fact, at the peak, there were, I think, eight flying schools. And the eight flying schools included a flying school run by Tom Sopwith. And what, what interestingly uh, came up, because the reason that this talk is actually happening, is because in um, the earlier part of this year, a Brooklyn's Bulletin had an article in it about Tom Sopwith's flying school at Brooklyn's. Now, the reason I was sent this copy of the magazine, because at that point I wasn't actually a Brooklyn's member, but I am now, I've rectified the problem, uh, was because a few years ago I helped a chap called Adrian Ward construct the replica of the little Japic cycle car, which was raced at Brooklyn's and set a number of records. It's a 350cc Jap engine, little aluminium cigar-shaped racing car with, bike, with motorcycle wheels and a motorcycle engine and gearbox and essentially a motorcycle-built car. So it was called by Movie Tone News. There's a Movie Tone News item about the smallest racing car in the world, which is worth looking up on the Pathy News archive. You'll find it there. And you sh it shows this little Japic running up and down the start and finish straight at Brooklyn's and going around the banking. And indeed, that Japic was burnt to a cinder in 1931 at Montmorey Track in France. And so the original car doesn't exist. So Adrian had the plan to build a new one, and I helped him do so. I built the steering wheel for the car and helped the wheels, wheels be built and provided a gearbox and all sorts of other things. But the end result you've probably seen here, because he's had it here, and it also appears in one of the Brooklyn's uh, television channel programs, all about him running it here. So having asked for a copy of this bulletin, which has the article about the jabbing in it, where I'm actually credited with having done some of the work on the car, which is quite nice, I then discovered this article about the Tom Sopworth School of Flying. And that solved the problem. The problem I had is that I had borrowed the Alfred albums from the family back in 2018. And in 2018, I realized that the albums did have pictures of the bikes that I had borrowed them for, but also they had a massive collection of wonderful images of Brooklyn's here, the flying activities on the airfield at Brooklyn's, in 1913. And this album recorded Halford's time as a pupil at the Bristol School of Flying, but they also recorded when Halford, at the end of his course, was issued a flying certificate and then was employed by the, music, by the school of, of flying to be an, a, an engineer maintaining the fleet of aircraft that they flew, which they learned to fly on, which were Bristol box kites, which were built by the Bristol uh, tramway company, the Bristol and Col British and Colonial Aviation Company, which was an offshoot of Sir George White's Bristol tramway car, the, the tramway um, company, which was where the whole business of aviation started. And it turned out that George White, the principal of the Bristol tramway depot, had met the Wright brothers when he went to France in 1909. And in conversation with the Wright brothers, Sir George White thought there was actually a really good business opportunity with aviation. So unlike many people who watched from the sidelines as aviation was very much in its infancy, George White thought, ah, let's build an aircraft and let's make a business of it. So he started out getting a design of an aircraft from Voisin in France, who was one of the, I suppose in 1910, 1911, one of the more successful French aviators and why not copy something successful? So that's what they did. But the first aircraft that the Bristol and uh, Br Br British and Colonial uh, Air Aviation built was a copy of a Voisin air aircraft, but it wasn't very successful. So having had no success with the first aircraft, they went back to the publications of the day and they found a line drawing of what was effectively a Farman biplane. And it was the Farman Longhorn. Now, the Farman Longhorn is essentially a biplane with a horizontal impenage out the front and vertical rudders out the back. So it looked pretty unusual, but it was quite a successful flyer. So looking at that little three-view drawing that was published in the, in the aeroplane magazine of 1910, or thereabouts, they set to and they built a new aircraft. 
I, I should have pointed out that when uh, when Halford was actually uh, in the process of raising money to get his fee together, we I actually found the advert in Motorcycle for 1913 where he offered his Martin Jack for sale. So that was him. He says giving up racing, and the reason he was giving up racing is he was taking up flying. And his mother had lent him the money, but he decided to sell his precious bike because he didn't think he would need a bike. What he needed was the 40 quid to help pay for the actual flying. So that's the young Halford financially equipping himself. But his mother, conscious of the fact that his son, her son was going to go off and fly, decided to kit out her son in the latest flying gear. So he bought this, um, bought this outfit. Now... That, you may recognize the helmet as the helmet like Vivian, like S.F. Cody wore when he flew the C Cody Cathedral, and it's a big heavy leather coat. What's quite interesting is this picture is in the albums several times, so clearly it was put in the albums to please his mother, who I think purchased this very expensive flying suit. When he actually got to Brooklands and was actually flying, not a single picture in the albums shows him wearing this outfit. Nobody was wearing outfits like this, largely because they were too heavy. And when it came to early aviation, weight was the king. So the lighter your gear, I think people might have gone up in light clothing just for the sake of saving weight, because weight, every, every ounce of weight of the pilot adds to the burden of the aircraft. So this outfit was there and in the album to prove to his mother that he was properly attired, but he never actually wore it. So then... We got this, when he, when, he went, when he started his journey to go to Brooklands, he bought himself a big album, and the album is on the table there, in, in, in the um, right hand of these two images there. This, this little book here is the book I showed you before, and the album itself is here, which is obviously, it says on the front, album, but when you look inside, it's essentially, oops, it's essentially a scrapbook of literally loose paper with pasted up cuttings from the flying magazines of the day. And he kept that daily as a record of what was going on. And the entries record the fact that we knew that flying in those early days was very dependent on the weather. So there are many days when they couldn't fly. So the entries say, weather too bad, no flying today. So they did other things. And of course he helped maintain the aircraft. And that's again where he fueled his interest in, in um, in the engines of the aircraft. And when he went to the flying school, he actually met the head instructor, who's a very interesting character on the right of this picture. Now his name appears to be Warren Merriam. Now I don't know if anybody here uses the Google dictionary function. You may have noticed on a dictionary inquiry on Google that you find extracts from a, well, it's like an encyclopedia called the Merriam Webster, sorry, the Merriam Webster Dictionary. Does that name ring any bells? Well, Merriam of Merriam Webster's Dictionary was a lexicographer. He was a dictionary writer. And he was one of the most successful dictionary writers in America. And he made a fortune out of writing dictionaries and those of you who are of the same generation as me, I guess most of the people in this room, may also remember the Rowan and Martins laughing on television. And they used to go on about Funk and Wagnall. Well, Funk and Wagnall were successful lexicographers in America, as indeed were Merriam and Webster. But those dictionaries are still around today, but the Merriam-Webster dictionary is named after this Jack Merriam. But Merriam has not any connection with this guy other than... Here's the interesting story. Merriam, um, Warren Merriam's real name was Frank Warren, but aged about 25 or thereabouts, not a, not a very young man. Many of the people in early aviation were young. But Mr. Warren really wanted to fly. He was passionate about it. But unlike Halford, he didn't have a wealthy mother who could find the 75 pounds. So, being an, being an enterprising kind of fellow, he wrote to this chap Merriam in America and said that he was very interested in aviation and he would very much like to learn to fly. And the only obstacle that he had in this process was that he hadn't got the money to do so. So, would the very wealthy Mr. Merriam be kind enough to sponsor his learning to fly? 
Now, for some reason, which is hard to fathom, Mr. Merriam gave him the money. And in honour of the fact that Mr. Merriam gave him the money to learn to fly, he changed his name. So he changed his name from Frank Warren to F. Warren Merriam. So the name Merriam lasts in the world of aviation, thanks to the generosity of Mr. Merriam, giving Frank Warren the money to learn to fly. But the interesting thing about Warren Merriam was, in terms of aviation, he was very much an older man. But he's written an autobiography, and again, this is one of the things that I've come across because of this particular story. And he wrote this book called First Through the Clouds, and he flew here at Brooklands, that's where he, that's where he flew. And as we might imagine, the, what, the weather, I mentioned how predominant the weather was as a factor in flying. And one of the problems at Brooklands is often there was a lot of cloud cover. And basically the aviation that went on in Brooklands very seldom went on when there was cloud cover. And the reason was, if there was low cloud over Brooklands, they never flew generally beyond Brooklands. They, they, all the flying was contained within the area of, the, of the, the track, effectively. And they took off and they flew around, but they couldn't go up high because of the cloud cover. But Warren Merriam was the first man who decided that it must be okay to go up through the clouds. So at one point, I think in 1911, he actually went out with his with his box kite, and he took off when the weather was not really suitable for flying, because there was literally 100% cloud cover at Brooklands. And he went upwards with the box kite, which is a slow flying plane. So he circled and circled and circled until he found himself in the cloud. And he carried on climbing and climbing and climbing until he came out at the top and suddenly discovered himself in bright sunshine above the cloud layer. And now he had a big problem. He'd taken off from Brooklands with a relatively limited supply of fuel because these planes didn't have big fuel tanks. And he was now flying along on a sea of cloud. Uh, he had some idea of which way he was going because it had a compass. But he had no idea how he was going to get back down safely because basically, as far as the eye could see, there was cloud cover. And so he didn't know how to get down. So he set off to the west on the top of this bank of cloud. And he flew and flew and flew until he found a hole in the cloud. He was quite relieved when he found a hole in the cloud. So he went into this hole and he flew down and he, an he ended up somewhere out beyond Guildford. And all he could see when he came down were fields and a railway line. And so he came down and he landed and he asked where he was because he had no idea where he was. And he had to then organise to get himself back to Brooklands, and he basically had to leave the plane where it was until he could fly back in better weather. But the result of that was he then discovered that it was safe to fly through the clouds, provided you have means of, of, of navigating when you were there. And, and the story was part of the law, the law of his own achievements in aviation. And even though he was an older man, when he approached Sir George White for a job as the to, to run the Bristol Flying School when it opened at Brooklands, he was actually given the job. So he was the man who taught Half how to fly. And there is Halford sitting in his Bristol box kite. And you can obviously see he went up, first of all, not flying the plane himself, but as a passenger of Warren Merriam. And one, on, on one, of, one of his first passenger flights with Warren Merriam, he took this picture. And if you didn't have a caption written on the picture, you'd be hard pushed to realise what was going on here. But it's, it says here, Brooklands from 2,000 feet. So he was flying with Warren Merriam above the track, and he took his handheld camera and he pointed it at the ground and took a picture of the track from 2,000 feet. And that was one of his early experiences when he came to Brooklands to learn to fly. And the team of people that were in the cohort that he learnt with were these people here. This was in August 1913, and these were the people that he learnt to fly with. And in that group there is also Warren Merriam, and that's one, that's one of the school block box kites. They actually had five Bristol box kites, and these box kites were all powered by no rotary engines. Some box kites had different engines, but these all had no rotary engines. And in front of the box kite, there's a really interesting picture here, which is also in the album. 
and interestingly you'll see there is a handwritten caption. Many of the most interesting things about this album, not just the picture content, but the content of the captions, because the captions are very, very interesting as a source of information where to start looking. Now the three people in that picture, the one on the right is of course Warren Merriam. Now the lady on the left, again as revealed in the article in the magazine, this is a lady called Mrs. Billings. Now Mrs. Billings was the wife of a, a man called Erdley Billing. Hands up those of you who've seen the film The Magnificent Men in Their Flying Machines. I guess all of you, right? Well, in that film, made in the 60s, there were several replica aircraft. One of them was a replica Bristol box kite. One of the other aircraft, which appears in two different guises in the film, was called the Erdley Billing. And the Erdley Billing was built by her husband, Erdley Billing. Now, most people had never heard of Erdley Billing when the film came out, but the film included that, picked that biplane, which was a replica built at White Walton by Doug Bianchi, and that aircraft was basically flown originally as the Erdley Billing, which was all open struts and just two biplane wings and a triangulated fuselage, a bit like the row triplane, which is in the shed over there. But they also disguised the aircraft by putting in panels of canvas between the interplane struts to, con to conceal it as a different aircraft. And they called it the Japanese Erdley Billing. And they got a Japanese actor to play the pilot who was a Japanese participating in this famous air race. So there were two Erdley Billings in that, pl in that picture. One the Japanese Erdley Billing and one the original Erdley Billing. But as a result, the Erdley Billing, which very few people have never heard of, suddenly came to prominence. Because the Erdley Billing, I don't think the original planes, plane exists, but the pictures of it did, and when they built these replicas, they chose that as one of the replicas. But Mrs. Billing became sort of remotely famous because of her husband. Her brother-in-law was another Billing called Pemberton Billing. And Pemberton Billing, Noel Pemberton Billing, was the man who founded the Supermarine Company. Now the Supermarine Company, I'm sure you don't need reminding, built things like the Supermarine S6B that won the Schneider Trophy and also, of course, the Spitfire. So the Supermarine story is a very firmly assured place in history. The, uh, the, the early Billing story, probably less so. But the other reason that Mrs. Billing is remembered is because at Brooklands there was a real problem because the people who worked in the Brooklands track were basically toffs. Most of the people involved with the Brooklands track and the, the activities at the track were basically members of the Brooklands Automobile Racing Club and they were mostly wealthy people and the rights of access to the track and indeed to the clubhouse was very much limited to members of the Brooklands Automobile Racing Club. So the aviation people that came to Brooklands who were there out in the, in the airfield weren't allowed to go into the Brooklands clubhouse. So they had a problem because they were out on the airfield flying their aircraft and indeed they had some of the sheds on the track were actually owned by the aviators but they weren't allowed to use the clubhouse so Mrs Billing set, set up in the front of an existing hangar she built this, the, she and her husband built this glass fronted extension to the hangar which they called the Bluebird Cafe. Now again who knows the name Bluebird? Well, Donald Campbell named all of his, sorry, Malcolm Campbell, his father, named all of his racing cars after the Bluebird Cafe. So Mrs. Billings is assured a place in history because she was the proprietor of the Bluebird Cafe. Now, the third person in that picture, I won't go back, was a chap called Collings Pisey, wearing a lovely leather jacket with a very smart-looking pair of sideburns. He was one of the employees of the Bristol Tramway Company. And George White, the proprietor of the Tramway Company, spotted the young Collins Pisey working in the tramway depot. And when he was setting up the British and Colonial Aviation Company in Bristol, he actually asked Collins Pisey if he would come and be part of the enterprise. So he was an early trainee pilot and he worked on the engineering of aircraft as well. So he was a very all-round skilled guy. He was a mechanic and an aviator and had a very early pilot's license. So Collins Pisey became part of the flying instructors team at Brooklands 
when they set up the enterprise at Brooklands. But unfortunately, Collins Pisey then went out to the Dardanelles in 1915 to train pilots for the, uh, the you, you may remember, the Winston Churchill inspired um, thrust to take the war, the First World War, to the Dardanelles, out to the, 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 the Bosphorus and that, that area. And Collins Pisey in 1915 was training pilots in the Bosphorus, in, in the Dardanelles, when unfortunately he contracted tet uh, uh, dysentery, and unfortunately he succumbed. So unfortunately the young Collins Pisey, who's seen there as an instructor at Brooklands, two years after that picture was taken, they buried him in the Dardanelles, which is not a nice thing to know. And of course, the, um, the, the, the flying school ran these aircraft, which were called Bristol Box Kites. And again, when you look at the entire aircraft stood back, the name Box Kite does seem rather appropriate because it looks very much like the Box Kite that you might have flown as a kid. There's certainly plenty of wood and wire and canvas and plenty of resistance to flying, which is one of the real problems with the box kite, because even the replica box kite, which now lives at the Shuttleworth collection, which was built for the magnificent men in their flying machines, film. Whenever they fly it, they never fly it low to the ground, because its glide rate is about one in three. So if the engine cuts, the plane basically sinks like a stone. So if you're at low altitude, you can't go around and find somewhere good to land. You basically sink and drop to the ground virtually wherever you are. So whenever they fly the box kite, they immediately take off and gain altitude. And it usually flies at quite high altitude, which is not so good for the spectators because it's quite a long way up in the sky. But when it's in the sky, if the engine fails, they've got some chance of landing it safely. But it's quite a reliable aircraft because it actually runs a thing called a, an Ardam converted Volkswagen engine. So it's got a flat four Volkswagen engine. So it's actually quite a reliable replica. Now, the box kites that the Bristol school ran were all powered by 50 horsepower gnomes. And this is now where you start to inhabit the mind of Frank Halford. Because when I went down to look at the diary in the library in Farnborough, before I gave the first uh, rendition of this talk to Rolls-Royce Heritage, I wanted to understand more about Halford, and the, uh, the diary seemed to me the place to find more information out about the guy. And in this album, there was a whole collection of wonderful stuff, and there was a whole series of cartoons which the young Halford had penned, which was fantasizing about putting a 50 horsepower gnome into a motorcycle. Now he came to Brooklands obviously as a, an ex-motorcycle competition rider and now an aviator. So he thought let's put a rotary aero engine into a motor bicycle. So this is his fantasy motor bicycle. And he developed, he developed the theme a bit more. And the final picture <laughs> shows an engine inside a frame with the engine of course spinning round as a, as a rotary engine does which does look like a bit of a handful. But the young Halford was clearly taken with the notion of putting a powerful engine like this into a motorcycle. Needless to say, this is artistic license. No, there's no evidence that any such vehicle was ever built. But these cartoons are in this diary. And <laughs> there's also somebody writing, drawing a little caricature of a man. They called it a budge. It was actually, I think, a rudge. And of course, Halford had had a rudge. We've seen the pictures of it. So this was him being talked up and the saying that the, the bike might be blue, but the rider is red hot. But again, when you actually look at this series of albums, you, you see that every single picture has the type of the aircraft and the size, uh, horsepower rating of the engine. So here is... Um, Here's a Blario with an 80 horsepower gnome engine. This is actually called a Blario, but it's actually not a Blario. And again, this picture has a, has a connection to the film, The Magnificent Men in Their Flying Machines. It was when the makers of the film were casting around people who knew about early aircraft, they wanted to build a Blario monoplane. But they decided, rather than building a Blario monoplane, they would create a replica of an aircraft that Vickers 
famous shipbuilding company had built, which was called the Vickers Type 22. And the Vickers Type 22 was basically a copy of a, Bre a Blerio 11. And the difference, the only visible difference with the way the aircraft is, is constructed is that the shape of the rudder is distinctive to this aircraft. So in fact, a handwritten caption says it's a Vickers, you know, a Blerio Vickers at Brooklyn's again in August 1913. So this was a Vickers 22 being run at Brooklyn's when, when Frank was there learning to fly. And of course he took a picture. The picture, that's one of the better pictures because he was obviously working with an ordinary camera and not using anything fancy. It was never, never pictures taken in a studio. And um, here is one of the early Avro prototypes. This isn't a 504K, I think this is probably the 504 prototype, which is the predecessor to the 504K, which of course was one of the standard training aircraft used by the RFC during the First World War. And again, the name Avro written down the side. But again, 80 horsepower, no engine. And this is again another, um, well, it's a Sopwith with a green aero engine. And Aloysius Green was one of the famous British engine manufacturers who built engines. And he lived at Farnham, down, I think, in, 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 in Surrey. And Cody used an Aloysius Green engine in his Cody Cathedral, which was the first all-British plane to fly at, at Farnborough. And uh, the, 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 this is a Sopworth with a green engine that was at, involved in the Daily Mail Circuit of Britain prize. And another plane that they saw was this Martin side. And it's an interesting aircraft, again because of the engine, because this aircraft has an engine built by Beardmore in Scotland. William Beardmore was a great friend of German aviation pioneers. And he made an arrangement, because he was an industrialist looking for things to manufacture, he set up a factory in in near Glasgow, which was basically a Dalmuir on the Clyde out to the west of Glasgow. And he built a factory there and he was building copies of DFW aircraft, which were called Deutsche Flugwerke, and they had Austro Daimler engines in the German originals. And so Beardmore started building copies of these engines, which were six cylinder overhead cam engines. And the first Beardmore engines were 120 horsepower. And this one, I think, is 100. It's rated as 160 horsepower, I think. But it's basically a Beardmore copy of an austro daimler engine. And I think Halford was involved helping this, uh, the people involved with this aircraft to, make a, to get the engine running better. And this album also contains air pictures of a famous pioneer um, aerobatic a pilot called Adolf Pegu, and Pegu was the first man to loop the loop with an aircraft, and he also flew inverted. And he came to Brooklands to demonstrate flying inverted and looping the loop, and he did so with uh, a Blerio monoplane. Now, if you look at a feebly, uh, feebly powered aircraft like a Blerio monoplane, you wouldn't choose it to do things like looping the loop and flying inverted. But that makes it even more extraordinary. And they actually had a three-day sort of carnival at Brooklands, which had unbelievably 30,000 people came to Brooklands for the three days and paid money to come and see Adolf Pegu looping the loop and flying inverted. And when he was there, Frank Halpern was there and took these pictures. And that's him, obviously, in the aircraft about to take off. Again, the limitations of the cameras of the day mean that the pictures aren't the best. And that was him on the ground taxiing. And at the end of the demonstration, the crowd was so enthralled of this amazing demonstration of aerobatic, um, they, he actually called it aerial acrobatics. And that, I suppose, is where you get the word aerobatics from, by, by conflating the words aerial and aerobatics, and, and uh, acrobatics. So aerial acrobatics was what Pegu called it, 
and aerobatics is what they eventually called it. But when they got back, when he got back to the uh, land of the aircraft, the crowd rushed over and carried the, uh, the, the, the slightly shocked Begu back to the to the um, cl the clubhouse just around the corner here, and they treated him to a big slap up meal. And this is him being carried by the crowd back to the clubhouse. Quite a, quite an amazing event. Obviously widely reported in the press of the day. Of course, not everything that went on at Brooklands was worthy of a crowd and great cheers because there were a number of incidents. And here's a classic one. This is a Brock kite that has actually had a what you would loosely call crash landing. And um, this was one of the aviators from Brooklands that flew quite a, quite a lot with, with Halford. Halford was his sort of oppo. And this is the aircraft that um, Hind had just crashed in the, the day before. And it was literally left on the, on the field for the night. And they actually went to it the following day. I think they were concerned that the man himself was quite badly beaten up by the event. And so they left the plane and came back to it the following day. And Halford took the picture of the, the wreckage on the ground. And that plane was repaired and reflown. So it wasn't, it wasn't either fatal to the flyer, the pilot, nor was it fatal to the aircraft. And like many of the aircraft in the First World War that were damaged in fighting use, they were recommissioned. They were put back together and, and recommissioned. So that was the case. And again, the actual caption here on the, on the album, handwritten in Halford's blue ink on the, on the caption, describes the story a little bit. But having the contemporary report in writing on the actual album itself, makes understanding what's in the album a great deal easier because obviously the man who, was, who took the picture wrote the caption so there's no question about mistaking what's going on. Some of the things that Halford witnessed kind of almost defy belief and this little picture which was obviously taken on a bad day you can see that the, the visibility is far from clear whether he was planning to fly the plane nobody quite knows but this is a very interesting plane. You can read the caption if you struggle. But if you look at the picture close up, the, the picture close up see, lets you see how big, big the aircraft is. And of course, the, the helpful caption on the original image says that it's Serge de Bolotov's triplane. Now, hands up anybody here who's heard of Serge de Bolotov. Not exactly a well known name, right? Who's heard of Mr. Selfridge, who ran Selfridge's store in, in, in uh, Oxford Street? Well, Mr. Sir, Mr. Selfridge had a daughter, and Mr. Selfridge's daughter married Count Serge de Bolotov, who was a Russian émigré and what you would call loosely an aviation enthusiast. And a bit like some of these modern entrepreneurs, he was quite a wealthy man. So he wanted to have an, a go at flying. So he commissioned the Voisin factory in France to build him a triplane, and this was the result. And as you can imagine, uh, a wealthy Russian émigré with, with deep pockets commissioned something rather grand. And the Voisin triplane that results is, well, I think you would have to say quite a, an improbable looking aircraft. And Halford witnessed it as it was being taxied out at Brooklands for, I think, an initial hop. But as it was being taxied, this rather large and ungainly structure caught a gust of wind and the undercarriage collapsed. And that was the result. So the aircraft lurched when the undercarriage collapsed and obviously could no longer taxi. And of course, a crowd formed around the, around the, the, the stricken aircraft. And when you see the size of the people, you see the size of the plane, you can see what an outlandish thing it was. But actually, Serge de Bolotov decided that aviation was nearly not, not going to be the successful venture that he hoped for, and this aircraft was never attempted to be flown again. So Halford was there on the very day when this event happened, and he recorded it for his album. So that's nice to have. But some of Halford's exploits were truly outstanding. And this particular picture is one of the best examples in the album. 
Now, this particular picture is very significant for lots and lots of reasons. First of all, it has more writing on the picture and on the mount than any other picture in the whole album, because clearly this was a big day in Halford's life, but it was also a big day in Harry Hawker's life, because the plane is the famous Sopwith tabloid, and the Sopwith tabloid was actually designed and developed here at Brooklands, and in fact there is a replica of the tabloid in, in the museum. And this was the prototype, and when they were test flying it at Brooklands, they came up with the idea of setting records, not just for flying the aircraft solo, but flying it with a passenger. Now, this caused me a problem, because I look at the pictures of the tabloid, and when you read the original descriptions, you see that it was described as a side-by-side two-seater plane. But the aircraft is built round a gnome rotary engine, which is 50 horsepower gnome. And the width, of, there is a drawing existing of the dashboard of the tabloid, which is 32 inches wide. So in a 32 inch wide fuselage, which is how wide the fuselage was at the cockpit, you would have a job getting two small people in, let alone Halford and Hawker, so that Hawker, the pilot, could fly the plane with Halford sitting by his side to be the passenger in the plane to set passenger altitude records and rate of climb records. But this picture is testimony to the fact that they did fly it two up and they did set these records and it was quite a successful aircraft and indeed Harry Hawker later went to Australia before the war, this was in 1913, and he went on a trip to um, he went to, on a trip to Australia and left the flying, with the, the continued test flying of the tabloid to the kind of number two test pilot at Sopwiths, who was a chap called Howard Pixton. And Howard Pixton, they offered to enter the plane in the Schneider Trophy seaplane races, which were being held on the Mediterranean off the coast of Monaco in 1914. So before the First World War broke out, they ran the Schneider Trophy seaplane races in the bay off Monaco. And the, the now float equipped baby, or Sopwith tabloid, or now Sopwith Schneider they called it, was that same aircraft with floats fitted. And they flew it successfully and they won against quite strong international competition. So in 1914, which was the second ever Schneider Trophy, Sopwith's tabloid, now named the Schneider, took the trophy. And then immediately, of course, the war started, and Sopwith's role in the First World War aviation scene is very well known, with the baby, the, the camel, and the pup, and various other things. All through the war, Sopwith aviation were at the, at the forefront of right till 1918 when Sopwith was slightly uh, eclipsed by other things. So at the end of the peacetime and hostilities breaking out, the young Halford went for a job with the um, Royal Aero, or what is now the Royal Aircraft Establishment, the, what, was now, what, what was then called the Royal Aircraft Factory at Farnborough. And he was given a job at, as, the, um, as an engine inspector in the Aviation Inspection Department, the AID as it was called, the, sorry, the Aviation Inspection Directorate. And the young Halford then spent the war years working with aircraft and engine manufacturers to develop aviation during the First World War. So that was his First World War. He was also part, he was, he was also employed in, in, he was actually given a job in the RFC as well, so he had a kind of multiple role. But again, the story of his subsequent aviation history is very well written up in the Douglas Taylor book, which I would certainly commend to you there. And when he actually left the Bristol, the Brooklands, the Bristol Flying School at Brooklands, and went to become an AID inspector. Somebody did a little commemorative card celebrating the the, the illustrious career 
of Frank Halford to date. And this little card sums up some of his achievements as a motorcycle racer and as an aviator. And that little, little humorous card that was presented to him on leaving Brooklands is actually in the diary as well, which is a lovely survivor. And of course, Halford's post-war career literally became almost legendary because in the early 20s, there were a massive amount, there was a massive quantity of aviation hardware which was now being disposed of as no longer needed because once the war ended, military aviation effectively was almost put into st stagnation. But there was a vast stock of aviation equipment which was offered for sale and the government set up a company explicitly to sell off former military aviation equipment to the general public and the company was called Air Disco which stood for the Air Disposals Company and one of the things that they had in that collection of material was vast quantities of cylinder barrels and cylinder heads from engines that were used in the earlier part of the war which had been oversupplied and were sitting there. So one of Halford's first ideas was to take engine components which would be readily available from the Air Disco company and build a new crankcase and put together an engine using cylinder barrels and sometimes heads from these earlier engines. And that's how he started out with a family of engines, the first of them being called Cirrus, the Cirrus engines, which were basically cylinder barrels of Renault V8 air-cooled engines that were supplied for the early the aircraft like the BE-2C, which was the mainstay of RFC aviation from the very beginnings of the First World War. And these cylinder barrels were available by the hundred. So basically, Halford designed a crankcase and a crankshaft to, to fit four of these um, Renault cylinder barrels to, and they actually then put initially side valve heads on, and then they put overhead valve heads on. Then they built another series of engines, and in this time he'd connected up with de Havilland. So the de Havilland company built what were called the Gypsy series of engines. So again, the Gypsy Minor, the Gypsy Major, these were basically four and six cylinder engines, again largely based on air disco supplied surplus new cylinder barrels from the First World War. And of course the Gypsy engines went on to score great success in the many light aircraft that de Havilland built, the Moth aircraft, the, 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 the Gypsy Moth, the famous Tiger Moth, the Leopard Moth, the Puss Moth, and so on, a whole family of aircraft. And then later in the war, I should have mentioned in the First World War, one of the first aircraft engines that Halford got involved with was that Beardmore engine that we talked about, the engine which was a copy of an Austro Daimler engine. Well, Halford decided the way to improve the 160 or the 120 horsepower Beardmore was to put uh, a light alloy cylinder block with wet cylinders in it because again aviation, the problem with any aircraft is the weight factor. So a lot of these early engines that were liquid cooled had cast iron cylinder blocks. So using light alloy cylinder blocks would save weight. And the people who were very good at that were Hispano Suiza. The engines, for example, in the SPAD, the V8 Hispano, had aluminium cylinder blocks with wet liners. So Halford copied the technology that Hispano had, pump, had developed and used it for the Halford's development of the Beardmore engines. And there was a chap called Tom Pullinger, who was in fact the chief engineer at, at um, Beardmore's. Pullinger had started out working with Alexandra Darrick in Paris on the Gordon Bennett racing cars that Darrick built to compete in the early motor races. And so Pullinger had been in Paris building, air, build, building race cars and had come back to help work at Beardmore's and then worked with Halford and Beardmore themselves to build this developed engine and the BHP engine as it was called, stood for Brad, Brad Beardmore Halford Pullinger, was fitted into two of the de Havilland designed aircraft which have got DH type names, DH4 and DH9, but at that point they weren't built 
by de Havilland because de Havilland as a maker didn't actually form until 1919. But the DH4 and the DH9 were both designed by Geoffrey de Havilland and flew these Beardmore Halford Pullinger engines, BHP engines. And again, recently one of those has been restored. I don't know if you know about the historic aircraft flight, flight that's run by Guy Black. They fly out of um, Duxford Airfield and they have a DH9 which is flying an original still running uh, BHP engine which was um, miraculously found and restored and it's now running. But the list of engines that Halford was involved with rather goes on. Um, the, the, between the wars, Halford worked as an he worked as a consultant. He didn't take employment with any of the companies that he worked with, like De Havilland. He was employed as a consultant. He ran his own consultancy. And in the 30s, he worked with the Napier Engine Company, and they developed a whole family of very complex H configuration engines, which were 16-cylinder, effectively two flat eight-cylinder engines put one on top of the other with geared crankshafts. So they were very complex engines, and the names Dagger, Sabre, and, and Rapier were the engine types. Now, the Sabre famously powered the, um, the Typhoon and the Tempest, which of course were great uh, aircraft in their own right, very different in so many ways from the Spitfire. And the Sabre was an enormously complex engine, but it was one of the most powerful piston engines that flew in the Second World War. And then, at the end of the war, Halford got very involved with the design of jet engines. And of course, although Frank Whittle is rightly credited with having invented the jet engine, there were other people working in the field. And one of the big people working in the field was Halford. And Halford, for his employers, as it were, to Havilland, he created a whole family of jet engines, the Ghost, the Gyron, the Goblin, and others that famously powered some of the early jet fighters but also the jet airliner the comet which i'm sure you know was and wasn't a success it was a great success technically until unfortunately it suffered problems but one of the people i was hoping to have at this talk was frank halford's granddaughter who uh, Frank Halford, when he went to America at the end of the war to do a development project for Harry Ricardo, he developed a. He was working with the Harry Ricardo's organization to sell the combustion chamber technology that Ricardo had invented at the end of the First World War to the American automobile industry. So Halford was sent out to America to help sell the Ricardo combustion technology to the American automobile industry. And he met an, an American lady and married her, and he had a, a daughter. And by 1930, he had basically divorced his first wife and was, was unmarried for a long time. And then in the late 30s, he met um, Jeremy's grandmother and, and married her. And, and Anne Spring was the, was the child of um, Halford's second wife by another husband. So. Um, Jeremy is the, is the step-grandson, but the, the, the daughter that Halford had by his first wife, who was then living back in America, is now a professor at Boston University. And I'd hoped that Susan Walker, as she's called, would have come here and given us a little contribution about her interest in her grandfather. But what she's done in the interim is to actually put a little video together. So with any luck, if it, if it works, we'll see. I'm Susan Halford Draper Walker, joining you from Marblehead, Massachusetts. I'm the granddaughter of Major Frank Halford, whose portrait you see behind me here. Frank Halford met some of the early aviation pioneers there at Brooklands, and their work together defined not just warplanes, but the future of air travel, even leading to the birth of the jet age. As a young man, Frank Halford had left university in order to learn how to fly at the Bristol Flying School at Brooklands, going on to become a flight instructor there. At the outbreak of World War I, Halford joined the Royal Flying Corps at Farnborough, where he met, he met fellow aviation enthusiast Geoffrey de Havilland. The Royal Flying Corps, now known as the Royal Air Force, was the world's first and largest air force. Their flying was as experimental as their aircraft. As you can see, open cockpits, few controls, no navigational aids, 
But despite the rudimentary aircraft and the dangers of the unknown, a flood of volunteers wanted to fly and fight. The United Kingdom came out of the war with 31 times the number of aircraft than owned at the beginning of World War II, and importantly, an epidemic of interest in the new flying machines and their heroic flyboys. Halford was an engine man, and he'd already designed and tested a turbocharged engine. Uh, that's a predecessor power source to the jet propulsion engine, but it was for race cars. The engine was known as the Halford Special, seen here. De Havilland remembered Halford as a brilliant en engineer with an unbounded enthusiasm for racing. In 1923, the young man from Nottingham drove a race car with a Halford Special that posted the fastest lap at Brooklands, hitting a speed of almost 109 miles per hour. Halford, like De Havilland, wanted to turn his efforts to designing the right engines for flying machines. The faster, the better. Frank Halford, the engine man, was the perfect match for a fellow aviator and aircraft designer, Jeffrey De Havilland. He and his team began to imagine and build the next best, fastest planes, and those included a series of moth hobby planes, such as the Tiger Moth, the Gypsy Moth, as well as the record-setting Comet Racer. Here's the trophy for the celebrated London to Melbourne McRobertson Air Race, won in 1934, beating the Americans and Dutch contenders halfway around the world. My grandfather's engines also powered warplanes, the Wooden Wonder, the Mosquito Bomber, fastest plane in World War II. And finally, critically, he designed the Ghost engines embedded in the world's first passenger jet, BOAC's Comet, launched in May of 1952. In tribute to our late queen, here's a photograph of the 26-year-old Queen Elizabeth. There she is meeting with Frank Halford and Jeffrey de Havilland in front of the inaugural flight of the Comet. Um, the British-built passenger jet service was meant to usher in a new Elizabethan era when Britain ruled the skies rather than just the seas. Britain would have dominated the passenger jet travel industry, but for one fatal flaw, metal fatigue. It led to several comet crashes and grounded the fleet of passenger jets in 1954. And it ended the dreams of my grandfather, who died prematurely of a stroke the next year. I'm currently writing a book titled The Comet, The Hush Hush Boys, Jeffrey de Havilland, and the Birth of Jet Travel that will tell the story of the British Wright stuff, many of whom first met, flew, dreamed, and dared there at Brooklands. America is the birthplace of manned flight with the Wright brothers, but Britain, with its first patented jet engine and the world's first passenger jet, truly launched the world-shrinking jet age, where every man could fly. Here are travel posters advertising the first passenger jet flights. Thank you for your interest in my grandfather and all the visionaries whose adventurous pioneering spirit was born in Britain at sacred places like Brooklands. Well, that I guess is the kind of formal talk ended, but there's several points to say. First of all, if anybody has any questions, I would do my best to answer them. And at the end of this presentation, um, I'd like Jeremy Spring, Halford's step-grandson, to kind of formally present the albums to um, Tony Pilmer here, who's with us, who's the, uh, the um, head of the National Aerospace Library at Farnborough, where the Halford diary is kept, so that these documents can be kept together, because together they make an absolutely wonderful resource. And I hope at some point they will also be available as an online resource because both documents really um, are, are suitable for scanning and, and, and being available online. I've, I've done quite a number of obviously digital copies of the images from the album in the, in the, to, to make these um, presentation uh, images this, for this, today's talk. But clearly the album uh, and, the, and the diaries could all be scanned and available online. And they are absolutely fascinating reading. Again, it's an, e it's an era that it's very hard to conjure up now. But these kind of documents convey the, the, the spirit of the age.